Welcome everybody. We'll get started in just a few minutes once we give folks a chance to load on up. Everybody, welcome again. If I didn't welcome you before, we'll get started in just a minute or so. Cool. Uh, so welcome, everybody. I'm Greg, Tech for Campaigns CEO. Um, very excited for uh, tonight's program with uh, author David Daly and an amazing set of three candidates from the Minnesota DFL. Um, so just to sort of give you a rundown, we're going to do a bit of updates on um, Tech for Campaigns, new things we're working on, states that we're focused on, including Minnesota, and then we'll hand it to Daly. Uh, sorry, David, um, to speak about um, some of what he's he's written about and kind of he's, he sees the, uh, the the map and the update for the for the political year and then throw it to the candidates to hear about what their experiences with gerrymandering and and you know kind of what uh, campaigning in 2022 looks like and feels like. Um, so with that, I will hand it to Amanda, our head of operations, to run through what we're up to. Yes, hi everyone. Um, so grateful that you all could be here. Um, and yeah, let's get into some TFC updates. So I first want to touch on what's happening in the States because this is the stuff that drives what we do at TFC. Uh, wanna highlight two kind of really disappointing and frustrating headlines, the first that have come out in the last week or so. First is the don't say gay bill that, that passed in Florida. Um, this is a part of a larger effort on behalf of the GOP across the country to just politicize what's taught in schools. And this is really stuff that's um, affecting just the day-to-day -day of um, parents and kids across the country. And then, Voter suppression in Texas, we've known about these voter suppression efforts for a while now. And with the primary elections, um, we're kind of seeing it all come to fruition. And I think this number is actually in the 20,000s now for rejected mail-in ballots. Um, so yeah, over 20,000 rejected mail-in ballots um, from this past election. And, um, and so yeah, disappointing news re reiterates definitely the need to uh, educate voters on what's an intentionally very confusing and complicated uh, process for voting. And we're definitely making that a priority in our work here at TFC in 2022. And just both of these are especially noteworthy reminders of um, the type of legislation that's impacting the daily lives of Americans and how important it is to invest in flipping state legislatures in 2022. And, um, 
And another piece of information that came out recently is that um, top campaigns are still ignoring digital. Uh, top campaigns have only spent in 2022, 7% of their funds on digital versus the industry standard of commercial advertisers spending 63%. Um, and instead they're spending about 80% on cable and TV, uh, even though almost half of US homes are now CTV only, uh, connected TV only, and don't even have cable. So just a confirmation that Democrats are behind the times and how they're reaching voters. And, um, and another just really important reminder of how important our work and education is at TFC to try and change that. Um, and, uh, you know, convince campaigns to, to do more digital and to do that work ourselves. So let's talk about that work. Um, we are ramping up for a busy and exciting cycle in 2022. Um, and we're well on our way towards our goal of 175, working with 175 campaigns across uh, 500 projects. And we've started strong in 2022. Our volunteers have already built about 20 websites to help candidates in Michigan, Minnesota, and other states announce their candidacy on the right foot. And uh, we have several email fundraising projects, Facebook and Google ads projects and others uh, well underway as well. And, and yeah, we're um, either doing work already <clears throat> or in final conversations with most of the really important competitive states, excuse me, <clears throat> um, this year. And we just expect to have more of those conversations as we get closer to the 2022 elections. And so on our side, just wanna kind of update on what we're doing to prepare for um, absolutely crushing these goals. And um, internally, we have been focusing a lot on infrastructure improvements to not only ensure that we can deliver on these goals uh, to support a lot of campaigns across the country, but also to give our campaigns and volunteers a really awesome experience with us. So um, a lot of improvements to our website to just make it um, better to navigate and also adding sort of a recipe book of best practices that our campaigns and volunteers can use to drive their strategy on the programs that, um, that we support on, um, mostly on you know, digital programs. And then um, also just the volunteer onboarding experience, uh, making it smoother and easier for volunteers to um, understand what their first steps are and just really hit the ground running to deliver great value to campaigns. Cool. And oh, there's a surprise slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and just wanted to share that um, in the work that we've done so far in 2022, we've just received a lot of love from campaigns. Um, I think our work has just been really appreciated, and we can only hope and expect for more of that as the year goes on. So I um, want to share, but we'll get into our awesome guest speakers right after this, but, we, but before we do that, just want to quickly share um, how you all, if you're inclined, can help us reach our goals in 2022. Three quick things, um, recruiting friends to volunteer with TFC, applying for projects yourself, and if you're new to TFC, um, RSC paying for and for our uh, new volunteer welcome events, our next one is on April 13th. And then also donating to TFC. Um, organizations with smaller budgets like ours mean that your dollar, that your dollar really goes far. Um, and so any help there is appreciated. And with that, I will hand it back to Dave Daly and Greg to ch chat about um, gerrymandering. Uh, the most fun topic out there, um, but, but probably the most important. So I wanted to introduce uh, David um, just briefly and then kind of get into uh, what he sees as, as a state of things. And, and by the way, the, the Q&A thing on Zoom should be open. So 
would love to make this interactive. Um, if any of the candidates have questions for Daley, please feel, or for David, I keep saying that. For David, please uh, feel free to interrupt and, and really would love to, to, to make it more back and forth. So uh, David is a senior fellow at Fair Vote and is the author of Rat, Asterisk, The True Story Behind the Secret Plan to Steal American Democracy and Unrigged, uh, How We Are Battling to Save um, That Democracy. He's a former editor in chief of Swan.com, CEO of the Connecticut News Project, and someone that I, always love to hear from but not you know it's not always a, it's, it's a strange thing where it's like a, a wonderful speaker but about a sad subject so um david if you want to kind of just give everybody your view on on kind of what what what's in store and how the gerrymandering process wrapped up that'd be awesome sure happy to um thank you greg thank you amanda pleasure to be with you all such an admirer of the important work the tech for campaigns does to bring cutting edge tools and digital strategies that prepare candidates for our most important yet somehow underappreciated um, still elections for state legislatures nationwide. Um, especially thrilled to be joined by these tremendous candidates from Minnesota Senate. This might be the single most flippable chamber in the nation, which means your work, your donations and their victories are truly impactful and make all the difference between progress and gridlock in a closely contested state because you are with us today, I'm going to assume you understand that Democrats must do more than chase shiny national elections or pour millions into defeating red state Senate boogeymen. We saw the limits of those strategies once again in 2020. Joe Biden was elected president. He's been hemmed in by the filibuster. Megabucks were dumped into defeating Mitch and Lindsey and Susan Collins and a lot of that money, right? Might as well have just been set on fire. And meanwhile, as Amanda just showed us, we're reminded every day of the importance of state legislatures. Just think for a minute about all the crucial things controlled by them. Public health response during a pandemic, state policies on policing and racial justice, election law, how easy or how difficult it is to cast a vote, and who has those obstructions placed between themselves and the ballot box, who controls certifications of electors or authorizes statewide audits reproductive rights at the dangerous moment when the Supreme Court could undo Roe and state legislatures are turning citizens into bounty hunters against women and healthcare providers, whether or not our students can read books like Beloved or learn the nation's complicated racial history. But perhaps most importantly, in three quarters of our states, state legislatures control redistricting, both for legislative chambers and the U.S. House, meaning they dictate the playing field for the next decade of elections. And now that the U.S. Supreme Court has closed federal courts to partisan gerrymandering claims, the power to draw those lines matters more than ever. The future of our democracy and the kind of nation we want to live in all depends on who is in charge of state legislatures. Democrats got outflanked a decade ago in this fight um, in all of these crucial states that Greg and Amanda are talking about, and we're still paying the price for it. Um, after the 2018 elections, a blue wave year, 59 million Americans lived in a state in which one or both chambers of the state legislature were controlled by the party that won fewer votes that fall. And all of those states, by the way, were states where Democratic candidates won more votes, Republicans held control anyway. So we're talking about those 2011 lines in places like Wisconsin and North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Ohio, Texas. They not only endured for a decade, but they've given Republicans an upper hand in all of those states for another cycle. We landed in this position because Republicans understood the value of state legislatures for all of these reasons and invested in them at precisely the moment when Democrats decided demographics would be their destiny. Just over 10 years ago, Karl Rove published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal and revealed a Republican initiative called the Redistricting Majority Project or REDMAP for short. Republicans out of power in Washington after the 2008 Obama wave had figured out a path back it ran through state legislatures during a census year election. The plan was to control redistricting, to lock Democrats out of the process, draw themselves these friendly maps that would last for 10 years. Rove said it would be as easy as this. Republicans had identified 107 key state legislative races across 16 states, Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Florida, North Carolina, Michigan, states we keep talking about. They'd flood those sleepy local races with about $30 million 
And if they captured those down ballot races, they'd be able to draw themselves entrenched majorities in otherwise competitive battlegrounds, as well as take complete control of mapping about 190 of the 435 US House seats. That is a pretty good head start. It was a political masterstroke, right? $30 million. It's a, a bargain. Uh, it's the biggest heist in many ways in American politics. They found a loophole in the system. They drove a truck right through it. Um, we are still very much living in the nation that Red Map built. We all know how it paid dividends immediately. Obama is reelected in 2012. Democrats add to their majority in the US Senate. They win 1.4 million more votes for the US House, but Republicans hold that chamber and it's not even close, 234, 201, thanks to the lines that they drew themselves. We have had gerrymandering for years. Of course, you all are a tech audience though, right? You know the difference between the maps that were drawn in 2001 and 1991 and the maps that were drawn in 2011 and what's happening this year. It's high-tech mapping software. It's the speed of the computers. It's how granular and precise this data is. We've never been better at gerrymandering. And that's why these maps have really been etched in stone. We see this when you look at a state like Wisconsin, a pretty a uh, serious example of this in 2018, voters prefer Democratic candidates up and down the ballot. It's a big blue wave. Uh, Scott Walker goes down, Tammy Baldwin gets reelected. Democrats sweep all the statewide offices. They win about 204,000 more votes for the, for the state assembly, but Republicans hold that chamber 63-36. Um, you know all the similar stories, I'm sure. Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Texas, Ohio, Michigan, uh, Virginia. David Yes. I have really a question, if you don't mind me throwing you off a little bit. Nope. So how, how, have it, how has it changed this year from, from the historical background of elder gerrymander? <laughs> uh, yep. you, know, you, you know, and the sort of the high tech stuff you just mentioned. I've been hearing some articles that are saying uh, that it wasn't so bad and some articles saying, oh no, it was terrible. Yeah. Just the truth in the middle, was it terrible? Or was it not so bad? Like how, how, how did it turn out? How did the sort of, results reveal themselves? I would say I would say that it is sort of in the middle. Um, what you have is a closer partisan map that has not been as bad for Democrats as a lot of people feared. Largely, this is for two reasons. State Supreme Courts in places like Ohio and North Carolina have stepped up in order to pr prevent extreme gerrymanders in some of the places where they happened last time. And then Democrats have wildly gerrymandered states like New York and Illinois uh, in order to keep pace with what has happened in Florida and Texas and what um, continues to happen in Georgia and, and many other states. Um, then you had commissions that were adopted in, in Michigan and in Virginia that mm -hmm. have been um, uh, pretty helpful in, in, in bringing fairer maps to states that had really been tilted the other way for the last 10 years, um, but I would say that that has happened at the expense of a couple of things. Um, we really have a frozen national map now. Um, we might have the fewest number of competitive seats left in the country that we've ever had in modern times. People are saying it, it could be as few as 16, 17 competitive seats out of 435. That is you know, something else. Um, um, and it has been a brutal cycle for minority representation. A lot of these gains uh, in population uh, that you have seen by um, uh, black communities, by Latino communities, this has really been the driver of American population growth. And the entire point of redistricting is so political power follows um, a population patterns. And um, that has, has simply not been the case in Texas and Georgia and Florida and in all of these states that have seen the greatest gains in minority populations, they have actually lost a political power. Um, so I think that that is, is something pretty disturbing that we ought to be thinking about as well. Thank um, you. And I'm sorry, I was, I was one more call for questions from the audience. Uh, if the Q&A feature, you can put them directly in the chat, but sorry, dude. That's what was just. I couldn't help but cut to the <laughs> to cut to the the new news. I was getting there. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so what kind of what's the my perception of of kind of what we need to do is really be able to contest the the few that are left the most effectively and strategically we can is is that something you agree with is there another strategy here or is it really this has been the hand that we don't we, that means that we that the, the sort of bar for execution or, or bar is, is higher yeah i mean i mean um the 2020 elections determined what the playing field was going to be right um so once we knew who had which seats at the table um it was it was time to you know draw the lines, uh, and so there wasn't much that could be done outside of litigation. Uh, and litigation this cycle um, uh, has been effective in state courts, and it's been really ineffective in federal courts. Um, federal courts, of course, were closed under um, to partisan gerrymandering claims in the Common Cause versus Rucho case back in 2019, but you've you've seen Georgia, Alabama, some other states that have made racial gerrymandering claims under Section Two of the Voting Rights Act, claiming that minority votes have been diluted. Um, and what we've seen, uh, I think, has been uh, disturbing from the U.S. Supreme Court in two different ways. Um, one is in Alabama and in Georgia, the lower courts have said, yeah, these maps are gerrymandered. Um, but the Georgia case, they said, well, uh, there's just not enough time here uh, to you know, draw new lines. So you're gonna have to have the 2022 elections on these maps anyway, when we all know that it only takes about a week to you know, draw a new set of maps. Uh, and then, um, and then Republicans have also challenged the state court rulings in, uh, and they've tried to get the US uh, Supreme Court to uh, step in here uh, and they failed um, in the North Carolina and Ohio cases, but it was a six three decision and the three conservative justices um, along with Justice Kavanaugh uh, have really opened the door to something that you might've read about called the independent state legislative doctrine which suggests that when it comes to matters of election law, the judgment of the legislature is effectively supreme. Uh, and they are teeing up cases for the next session in which this could become um, a precedent, which I think would be dangerous uh, and, and contrary to the actual meaning of the constitution and a century of, of court precedent, but it makes the state legislative races that we're talking about here all the more important. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. So I have two questions, both sort of related to different, different facets of the concept of flippability, which I'll, I'll ask from the perspective of political science rather than as a, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, interjecting as a campaigner. Um, Jeff asks, does, does this sort of all mean that much of what we want to produce for our campaigns is to appeal to moderates? Is there an argument that you could, you know, peel off Republicans that could go moderate or maybe vice versa? What do you sort of feel about sort of the net, um, the, the net effects on, on the voting populace? You know, it depends on the districts in every state. Uh, I mean, um, you look at a state like Minnesota, it's, it's what, uh, I feel like I looked at it earlier, it's a 34, 31, somebody will tell me if I'm wrong, I'm sure. It's a, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, we are, we were, th it, were there 67 seats and we were 33, 34 Oof. down to the GOP and then two uh, Democrats flipped to independents. So it's technically 36, 31 right now uh, because the two independents caucus with the Republican party. I mean, I think what we need to do is be just as strategic about this as the Republicans were back in, in 2011 when they, uh, in 2010, when they identified the specific seats in the specific states that they would need to win. And then they focus group messages that would work in, in those districts and in those states. And they acted like these local state elections were national campaigns uh, and brought that level of sophistication to what they were doing um you know mm -hmm. i don't know what works best in 
in in those Minnesota districts, but um, or in those individual Pennsylvania districts that have to be won. Um, so is it moderates? Is it uh, Republicans? But we have to do the work to you know find out. Yeah, totally agree. And that's a lot of the work that we've been doing is is not um, is is really on sort of now that everybody's finally. Uh, we're having less of the conversation about whether you should be on the internet. It's more about what he's saying and how you say who you're saying it to and how do you get that actually across. So um, unless any of the candidates have a question, uh, I will close with uh, Jess's uh, question, which is, you know, at the headlines, um, or when we read headlines, some of these sort of headlines are saying that states are becoming unflippable. You know, yes, there's demographic change, but gerrymandering is um, really, uh, you know, fix that. And I know that's pretty much true. But um, maybe one way to answer it is the, like, when you look at 10 years, that's, that's kind of a long time. Weird things can happen. So what, what do you think? Is there, is there sort of a long-term hope? Yeah, uh, there's absolutely long-term hope. I mean, I mean, look at states like Texas and Arizona and those, you know, the maps in Texas last decade were deeply gerrymandered. And by the end of those 10 years, things had gotten super close, so super tight. Um, you know, Georgia uh, was, you know, very gerrymandered. It's gotten much closer. Um, now, of course, what is happening right now is Republicans get to remap all those states and push the finish line out a little bit farther. But um, this, this can't go on forever. We are going to catch up <laughs> with these lines. Um, it, is, it is only a matter of time the fact that Republicans feel the need to gerrymander this deeply and to pass laws like this is not a sign of strength. It is a sign of desperation and fear, and it's a sign of an unwillingness to meet the demands of a changing nation and a multiracial a democracy. We will have a multiracial a democracy, um, and but it takes time, right? I mean, we are still working to perfect a union that was, you know, founded with only white men of property having the right to vote, that um, that the reconstruction amendments guaranteed, you know, um, a black citizenship and equal protection only, you know, at the 14th and 15th amendments, the Voting Rights Act in 1965. We have a lot of work left ahead of us and, this is the work we all must do. Democracy is a, a verb. It takes all of us to work at it and to tend it. Small, small, uh, small capitalization democracy, small, small D. Um, thank you, David. I, with that, we'll throw it to Rob, our state director, to talk to three lovely DFLers. Please, everybody, feel free, or David, feel free to stick around and you can, you can participate in that. <laughs> uh, Rob, take it away. <clears throat> Thank you, Greg. Thanks, David. Um, before we get started with our three great uh, candidates from the state of Minnesota, um, I think everyone should throw in the chat like how they would rate David's room on there. I think he's a definite <laughs> 10 out of 10. Like that, that background is awesome. So uh, in addition to all, all the great information you shared. So <clears throat> uh, I'm Rob Harrell. I'm the state director uh, with TFC. I've been with the organization uh, since 2020. Um, and uh, in 2020, I was a state director in Minnesota, where it was a great honor to uh, take part in some of the uh, uh, campaigns there and happy to be joined today uh, by three great candidates that are running for Senate in Minnesota this cycle. So I want to give uh, each one of them an opportunity to uh, introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their district uh, first and foremost. So uh, why don't we start with uh, our incumbent on the panel, uh, Senator Eric Putnam. Hey everybody, uh, thanks for having me. So my name's Eric. Uh, I was elected in 2020 to the Minnesota Senate. Out of about 45,000 votes, I won by 315. So when you think about what you're doing and your opportunities to make a difference and to make a change, that's how close some of these elections are gonna be. Razor thin. And you could very possibly be the person who pushes it over the edge. So it was a super close election. And a lot of the elections in Minnesota are that close. Uh, I'm a professor at two uh, private liberal arts colleges out here. That's my day job, um, where I teach about public argument and the history of civil rights rhetoric and that kind of stuff. 
my community is fascinating. You know, a lot of you guys are in the, you guys are all tech folks. So you, so do some of you probably live in the Bay, right? Does anyone live in the Bay area? Some of you do? Well, I grew up in I East San Jose. I'm from East San Jose. And I grew up there in the seventies. And I saw orchards turn into apartments. And I know kind of what it's like to be in a community of great change. And that's what Minnesota is right now. Because with those kinds of deep structural changes, there's also kinds of opportunities and anxiety at the same time. And that's what my area in Minnesota is all about, St. Cloud. Uh, we have a, a, a tremendously dynamic population, uh, but demographics aren't destiny. We, we have lots of conversations about who we are and where we're going. And it's a, a wonderful place to be involved in politics because you get to shape those conversations. And I saw someone post in the chat earlier about converting Republicans or moderates. From my perspective, what we do is just can, uh, help people realize that our values are their values. The, the, our, our, our project here is revelation, not persuasion, uh, especially in central Minnesota, because we know as Democrats, as progressives of people who care about the issues of working people, that uh, we have uh, uh, their best interests at heart. We are who we're talking to. And that's what's I think incredibly special about the area that I represent, uh, because it's a, a concretization of some of those different forces and those opportunities. And Senator Putnam, where, where exactly is that in the state of Minnesota? Where give uh, give the viewers an idea of where where the St. Cloud area really lies in the state? All right. So like I'm a product of California public schools. So like I didn't even know Minnesota existed. And when someone told me Iowa was nearby, I was completely freaked out. I didn't know that was real. Um, uh, my area of Minnesota, St. Cloud, is about an hour northwest of the Twin Cities. So basically kind of almost in the geographic center of the state. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, for our, our next candidate, I'm going to throw it over to Heather Gustafson. Heather, you probably had what a lot of people uh, would consider a dream job that you left for what was your dream job, and now you're running for Senate. So tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, and I have to say uh, a shout out to Senator Putnam because I am from Sartell, Minnesota, and central Minnesota is a, a very misunderstood place. So I'm so happy that he's there. Um, yeah, I started out as a radio DJ. So I grew up in Sartell. I went to college at Moorhead State. I kind of fell backwards into a radio career. And I did that for about 12, 13, 14 years. I can't remember how long, a long time. And, um, and then ended up going back to college to get my master's degree in education. And so I am a world history teacher now. I've been teaching public high school for quite a while. I've been a teacher for about 12 years. Um, and somewhere around 2016, I uh, decided to get a lot more involved in the local, uh, our local elections. And again, I'm falling into another career. So um, yeah, it's, it's been exciting, but yeah, just, and, and I will just say though, out of those things, you know, the three things, three careers that I've just mentioned, right? I mean, I don't know that this is a career, this is really more an extension of a, of a service to my community, but I would say like, they all vary, all the skill sets overlap with each other very well. And, um, and really like, like this and teaching and being in broadcast are all really just about connecting with people. So um, it's not as, it's not as varied as you think it is. It's all actually kind of the same job. So yeah. And it feels like public service runs in the blood. There. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. And, and finally, uh, definitely honored to have Alan Moy with us tonight too. Um, Alan, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself because your story is, is pretty special. Thanks, Rob. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alan Roy. I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the White Earth Nation in Northern Minnesota. My cousin happens to be Peggy Flanagan, the Lieutenant Governor of Minnesota. I, um, I've been in tribal politics for about four years now. I was elected. Uh, my term is expiring this year. And um, when the redistricting happened, uh, the, it's done by the courts in Minnesota. So a lot of folks uh, had approached me uh, when that came out in February and they wanted me to run. And I had run two years ago. Um, this is a deep, deep, deep red area in Minnesota, very deep red. However, what's interesting about um, this area here is now there are the three largest American Indian reservations in the state of Minnesota in the same Senate district. And so we feel pretty confident that we can flip this district. My background, I, I'm, a, um, I'm a tribal leader. I'm a, a father of three. I went to school at the University of Minnesota. 
I'm an Army reservist. I command a unit out in Denver. I, um, I was on active duty, went to Iraq, been all over the place. Um, and so I just like to call myself a Democrat, just a regular old American here up in northern Minnesota, just trying to do right by everyone that lives here. So, but just really honored to be on here. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks for being with us. Um, you touched on something at the end there, Alan, that um, uh, when I was working in Minnesota in 2020, I would come back to my fellow TFC staffers and I'd say they're so, they're just gosh darn so nice in Minnesota. <laughs> like, I don't like what, what's going on. And all, all three of you have, have confirmed that. But what, um, you know, and, and, and take this, we can take this in, in whatever order uh, you raise your hands here. But uh, what, what gets uh, Minnesotans blood boiling in this election? What are the issues that are, are really going to be front and center for all three of you? Maybe we'll, we'll start with you, Alan. Sure. I, I know in northern Minnesota here and in Minnesota in general right now is the economy. Um, a lot of folks are having a discussion around that, especially with the international incidents that are happening. Uh, the gas prices, that's being discussed regularly. Um, I, I talk to tribal members and non-tribal members alike. A lot of folks are having this discussion. However, what's unique to Minnesota is that uh, we have a very, very huge uh, surplus. And I just seen the governor, Governor Walls, come out today, talk about uh, some money getting back to some of the citizens here in Minnesota. So that's going to be helpful. Um, it's going to be helpful for our workers and our families. Um, what I do know is that a lot of folks are, are getting back to work which is a good thing. Uh, the effects of the pandemic are, are starting to go away a little bit, um, but we still need, we still have a lot, a long ways to go forward. Uh, we need to make sure that our educators are, are being um, taken care of, our schools, our students. Um, th these are all very big things that are happening right now. And a lot of it's being driven by the economy. And so I know that's true for the conservatives as well. Um, I do have conservative supporters up here. Um, I was endorsed by Colin Peterson, uh, for those that may know him in Minnesota. Um, he was in our Senate, our congressional district before the redistricting happened. And so um, we, are, we are having discussions with everyone across the board. So, but yeah, definitely the economy right now. And, and Heather, um, Alan, Alan touched upon the governor's proposal, I think from today, and I think last week, in the Democratic controlled house, they had a bill also talking about a gas tax holiday. Are those, are the inflation prices, are those the things that you're hearing and as your campaign starts to get off the ground? Yeah, I mean, absolutely the gas tax is because, I mean, like I just filled up yesterday and it was $70 and it's, you know, normally maybe 50, 55, something like that. And so I, I did, I took a look at it like, whoa, okay, this is happening. Um, the gas tax would, tax would be, uh, you know, I think is, is something people are talking about, but, um, you know, then you wonder about like, is it, are we going to actually see the difference? Are gas stations going to be, you know, honor that, um, hmm. you know, so those are some things obviously that the gas is going to be a big thing, especially with summer approaching. But I would just say that what I noticed the most, and I think one of the things that motivated me to run is being a public uh, school teacher right now, Minneapolis uh, teachers are um, asking for smaller class sizes, for living wages, um, for, you know, mental health resources. And so that is kind of, um, I would say, a consistent thread with most of our communities is that uh, public schools are under attack. And, you know, never before, I, mean, I teach world history, and, and we just, you know, teach the standards, and never before have we been um, put in such a controversial position. I mean, I, I can't, it's, it's, it's just uh, nerve wracking every day to even just open up your email and find out what you're going to be getting in. And so um, I think, you know, we're defending our public schools right now. We're, we're standing by our students. Um, we know that what, uh, what student conditions are or what our work conditions are or what student conditions are, right? Like teacher support is student support. So, um, yeah, I mean, the public school is probably what I hear a lot of um, from just neighbors and moms and um, people who live in my community about like, you know, what we can do to make things more fair and equitable. Thank you. Senator Putnam, um, we heard from David earlier talking about um, the Minnesota Senate being maybe the most flippable 
uh, body of government uh, out there in the country this, this cycle. Um, what's it gonna mean to people in South St. Cloud and the rest of the state of Minnesota um, when the DFL is able to flip the, the Senate uh, this cycle? What, what's that gonna mean to real people? Sure. You know, so um, I, I, first I want to uh, acknowledge uh, Heather real quick, because it's, I'm glad that she's talking about education, because the person that she's run against is a troglodyte who hates books. So um, I'm very, very hopeful for her election in particular. Uh, now, um, when it comes to the sort of general political climate right now, uh, as a, a sense of getting how things are going to be better once we win, I think that the primary issue right now in this election is anxiety. Um, everyone's anxious. We're still COVID-y. I mean, I know that's not an adjective, but it, we're still COVID-y and we're coming out of that and all the trauma that we've experienced in the last two years. And so we're gonna look for things to hate, whether that's the teachers in your school, or the, the school board, whether it's uh, gas taxes, we, we are unfortunately in a position right now, I think where our primary concern that we're likely to engage in this electoral cycle is dealing with that anxiety and its tendency to manifest into hatred. So again, our job is, I think, to counteract that and to say that once we get elected and once we get the majority, we're in an opportunity to actually institute things for people who care about each other in a new way. That to me is the fundamental difference. It's not this policy or that policy. It's that when Democrats are in charge in the Senate uh, in, uh, in 2022, we'll be in a position to start talking about care in ways that are, I think, significant to everyone in our communities. When we think about child care, and, and the parents who can't go to, to work because of their anxiety over their kids, not knowing where to place them, not being able to pay for it. Um, when we think about people who have uh, uh, elder care, seniors in homes who we can't see, these are all just moments of, 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 of care being frustrated. Um, but the same is true, I think, when it comes to public safety, which is going to be a significant issue in this election. It's a controversial one, goes in lots of different directions, but again, the fundamental thing animating it is our anxiety. Um, I think once we are in control, and I, I firmly believe that we will be, especially with your help, uh, we'll be able to forward a more bold care agenda where we talk about how to help each other uh, and a little less uh, how to undermine or distrust each other. We are, we are definitely looking forward to uh, providing some of that help um, on the TFC front, our volunteers are fired up. As you know, you, you have two projects coming up, both the website and a digital ads project really early in the cycle, to be quite honest, right? To be running digital ads. And, and you mentioned Heather's opponent, but um, you, you've had some GOP messaging going against you already as an incumbent in your district. Um, what are they saying and, and how is digital important uh, for you to sort of combat um, you know, some of the lies that they're frankly putting out there? Oh, it's incredibly important. And yeah, I'm already being attacked. I started getting attacked on radio and on online ads about a month ago. Um, and it's what you're going to see largely here is an effort to attach Democratic candidates to the brand of the Democratic Party, which has suffered in years here. Uh, and uh, where I'm at, and I think where Alan is too, people are typically, they self-identify as independents. They're most likely kind of center right, most likely, but, but by and large, they kind of identify as independents. And so being attached with the brand of the DFL, I don't know how it is for Alan, but if I get attached as being a DFLer, it means I'm from Minneapolis, mm -hmm. which then has a connection to raced populations and urban blight and those kinds of things. So that's what they're already doing to us right now is they're saying, oh, you know, anyone who's, who's, who's a Democrat is just one of those cities people, uh, which is divisive and unpleasant and it pits the cities against the rest of the state. Um, uh, so that, that's kind of the, 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 the early theme that we're seeing. Now, when it comes to digital advertising in particular, I was really surprised by the graphic that you showed earlier, uh, uh, Amanda, when you said 7% versus 60%. This is an incredible opportunity because the Minnesota GOP basically does most of their internet stuff on an abacus. They do a lot of it, but they don't do it in a way that's attuned to the dynamics of the medium. And the DFL hasn't been especially good about that either. They basically take sort of general commercial strategies and apply them to political advertising. I don't think they really understand what truly can be done creatively to, to get your message out online. When you got people who know what they're doing and you got people that care talked about to them about it. So um, to me, that's the big key is that um, digital advertising for us is an opportunity for much more creative engagement with um, the electorate. And, um, and I think that's an opportunity that we've had that the GOP has yet to take advantage of. 
Awesome. And we we have a few questions uh, in our final minutes that are going to come from some of our volunteers who uh, we're highly encouraging to sign up for these projects. We mentioned Senator Putnam's uh, website and ads projects kicking off soon. Uh, Alan's website project is getting ready to get staffed and, and uh, underway. And uh, later in the cycle, uh, we'll be working on ads for Heather uh, as well. So uh, exciting opportunities to make a real difference in Minnesota. Uh, but my last question uh, for each one of you um, is, what's your go-to hot dish? Like what? Uh, what? What's the one that uh, never fails? We'll we'll uh, we'll start with Alan. My, mine is wild rice hot dish with a little bit of uh, garlic and um, just some just some regular hamburger. And uh, you, you get the the tater tots in there, and you just mix it all up, and it just it comes out really good. And a lot of butter, a lot of butter. That's that's my go to wild rice hot dish. That, that that's some good American wholesomeness right there. How about you, Heather? What what uh what, what's the one you never leave home without? Yeah, I would just say tater tot hot dish. So I think there's got to be a running theme because if Eric says tater tots too, then we know that that must be a Minnesota thing. But it is just tater tots, green beans. We do cream of chicken soup and hamburger, and yeah, it just smells like heaven. Nice. <laughs> and Senator Putnam. Last but not least. Rob, what are you doing to me, man? Are you working for the bad guys? <laughs> yeah, I told you I'm from California. I lived here for 25 years, right? But I told you I'm from California. That, that actually was the theme in my past election cycles is they say California liberal, Eric Putnam. And I have a big photo for <laughs> tattoos. So you just, I, I like hot dishes, wonderful, and apple pie and hot dogs. Love them all. Yes. <laughs> good answer. Good answer. And you're right. I, I, as a Californian myself, I know that follows you everywhere else you go. Like, so uh, we did, we had a question um, from one of the volunteers and uh, maybe I'll, I'll kick it back to you, Senator Putnam, um, since you touched on this, can you explain the DFL and what the differences are there for those of us who are not totally familiar with Minnesota politics? You know, there's a there's a great book. This is something you're interested in by a former senator named Dave Durenberger. It's called uh, When Republicans Were Progressive. And it's a history of Minnesota politics in the 20th century. Um, and it talks about how Republicans in Minnesota actually founded our pollution control as agency and created the income tax. They used to be actually pretty reasonable humans. Um, the DFL uh, was originally basically two different parties. There was a Democratic Party and the Farmer and Labor Party. And in the early part of the 20th century, the Democratic Party was associated with corruption, Tammy Hall kind of issues like insider, you know, bureaucratic bad stuff. And the Farmer and Labor Party was um, much more well-respected. So the two joined, I think, in the 1950s and became the DFL, which is the Democratic Farmer and Labor Party. Awesome, thank you for that. And thank you, all three of you. Uh, David as well for being with us tonight. Like we greatly appreciate the time. We're looking forward to working on all of your campaigns uh, and we'll uh, get this group together uh, in November when we celebrate uh, three pretty big victories. So I'll kick it back to you, uh, Greg, to finish off for the night. But uh, for me personally, thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions, and man, it might be the, the good time for the uh, project links. Um, but Brent asked something about the importance of websites. Uh, maybe they don't seem as important as they must say. Can you, what is, what is the importance of a good Canada website? The importance of a good Canada website is the central uh, place for all of that, um, for all that work when you have a digital ad, when you have um, an email, when you just hear about somebody on the radio, on TV, it's the place that you can Google. And uh, we often see that, um, as, uh, as uh, we get end to the end of the year, uh, visits to campaign websites go up and up and up and up and up. Um, and especially in the last week, as folks get ballot guides and, and sample ballots, um, people are, are often um, looking to, to, to learn who, who's who. Um, one of the sort of tricks about say legislative politics is generally speaking, nobody knows who you are. Um, so that's the big challenge. It's, it's uh, it's that revelation uh, that the senator was talking about. So when, when somebody does hear your name, you wanna make sure that you're in position to have uh, a strong story to tell uh, about who you are and what, you're, what you stand for. Any final questions before we go? And with that, I won't, I won't keep everybody. So thank you so much for coming. Really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you, David. 
um, Alan, Eric, Anne, Heather, Rob, and Amanda. It's a wonderful program. Um, please sign up for a project, uh, refer a friend, or donate to a program which makes us all happen and gets all of the help to these candidates that need it. Have a great night and thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye.